but I think what really keeps most people is the minute it gets a little uncomfortable because we're soft. People are soft. Men are soft. I'm sorry. Like, so the minute it gets challenging or a little bit uncomfortable, let me put my pacifier back in my mouth and curl up with a little bit of pornography. Like that's, I mean, that's, that's probably not the best answer that a coach would be saying on a yeah. podcast, but I think it's, I mean, I think it's the truth and it's something I've spent a lot of time really thinking about the last 14 days. Like, Welcome everybody to Born Unstoppable. My name is Tiago and I believe you were uniquely designed to be an unstoppable force for good. Each episode, we will be bringing you incredible guests that have overcome challenges in their life so that you can learn from their experience and implement their strategies to grow in the areas that matter the most, your health, wealth, and relationships. Hey, welcome back to Born Unstoppable. You are in for a treat this episode. It's such a powerful episode. Let me introduce you to the guest. My guest is Frank Rich. He's a CEO and founder of Rebuilt Recovery. He helps men break free from the porn addiction through the power of faith and fitness. Frank is a good friend of mine. I love him. He's a great, great friend of mine. And In this episode, we talk about how pornography affects the brain, how it affects our lives, and what can be done to find freedom from the shackles of porn, such as looking at our faith, exercise, nutrition, and optimizing our environment, and obviously finding mentorship. So please share this episode with your friends and family. This message needs to get out there. It needs to be heard. So many men's lives are being destroyed by this pornographic addiction, and they need to know there's hope. They need to know that there are people who have found victory in this struggle. So before we jump in, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts. It greatly helps people notice this podcast, and it lets me know what you're enjoying about it. I love reading the reviews. I love seeing them and connecting with you guys there. All right, get ready to take some notes down. Let's get into it. All right, Frank, welcome to Born Unstoppable. How are you doing? I'm doing amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, really, really excited about this conversation. I am happy to have you on the show. And as you know, the general theme of this podcast is to talk about how we can improve our faith, family, fitness, finances, and also have fun. And I got that fun, I think, from you because that's very similar kind of belief and values that you have. And I know that you specialize on helping men break free from porn addiction through the power of faith and fitness. And I also know uh, that porn is a shackle that ties us down in every aspect of our lives. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. But before we dive in, I like to start my podcast off with a rapid fire uh, questions. So I'm going to ask you some questions you can answer quickly. And then if we need to, we can circle back and talk about them. Sound good? Yeah, let's uh, let's shoot, man. All right. So, where did you grow up? Tampa, Florida. Okay. And where do you live now? Tampa, Florida. <laughs> oh, you're still there. Okay, that's not good. Uh, that's not bad. That's a good place to to be from and to grow uh, grow up in and like stay. So, what's one of your favorite books? You got many books behind you. Oh my goodness. Um, well, we have to, you know, we have to plug the Bible because it's the ultimate source of wisdom and the only source of uh, ultimate truth. Um, so I'd say the Bible yeah. and probably the book that has really had the greatest impact on me, on my perception of the world, on my perception of life over the last couple of years has been 12 rules for life. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, uh, have somebody that have, you know, read and consumed probably close to a thousand books, but um as far as like really having an impact on me, on my beliefs, on my yeah. philosophy for life, would probably say it's 12 rules for life with a very close second uh, being beyond order, which is the second set of 12 rules. Really? Wow. Okay. So I've always wanted to read 12 rules for life. Uh, I'm just a bad reader. Like I read, but I just don't prioritize it enough. 
And so I have books that I still haven't read. I have books in Kindle that I'll start and never finish. But maybe I'll write that down, make sure that I get through that book to those two books um, before the year's over, take down some notes. I heard good stuff about yeah, it. Yeah, and it's obviously, uh, I mean, you're at a different uh, season and in, in stage of life. You know, the, the information that you've been consuming uh, over the last couple of years is, is much deeper and, and more involved um, than probably a lot of the books that, that I've read. But um, yeah, I think that there's probably stuff inside of there for everybody. Um, it's a book that uh, I first read 12 Rules back in 2018. Um, and I've read it every year since. So it's one of those books that becomes mm. a staple um, because depending upon where you are, depending upon you know what you're kind of seeking uh, as far as getting into the book, you'll always get exposed to, to something new. So yeah, um, definitely worth worth a listen or, or read if you're you know if you're an audio guy then, then listen to it. Um, but it's not a light read. so you know don't don't jump into it mm. thinking it's something you're gonna kind of breeze through because um, it's very deep. It, there's it, it's it, uh, it, there's layers to understanding it. but uh, yeah, I definitely think it's a book that everybody at some point, in their life should read. Okay, good. Um, what's one of your superpowers? <laughs> um, it's such a tough question because it's it's like you have to brag <laughs> almost in a way you have to brag about yourself. And I'm, I'm you I'm, you I'm have permission on, to brag. I'm working on humility <laughs> here. Um, you know, I would I would probably say it, it, it it's maybe an extension of talking about twelve rules. It's maybe this this ability that I have to process high level concepts or a lot of information at once and decipher it down into simplified, uh, actionable uh, steps or, or 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 practical application. Um, and I think that's what has made me a great coach. I think that's what has made me um, a great podcaster because I consume I consume a lot of information. Um, but yeah, if I, you know, maybe I had to point my finger on, on something, I would maybe say that a superpower that I have is the ability to consume a lot of higher, higher level information, um, and cipher down into easily, you know, actionable steps. Amazing. Yeah. It's not bragging. And if anything, we can just say that's how God gifted you, right? Mm -hmm. So all glory goes to God Amen. that, um, you have a gift that you can then teach others and you're doing it by helping them break free from the shackles of porn. Yeah. And, 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 and it's so great that you added that in there because, you know, my, my podcast, which, you know, I'm sure we'll get into at some point today is called the superhuman life. And that, uh, you know, that super component is that kind of, you know, connection in, you know, to God and, and understanding that, you know, when you live a superhuman life, you're walking in your God given purpose. So to call it a superpower maybe truly means that there's something truly, you know, supernatural divine to it. And, and yeah, just like you said, it, that was the, that was the gift that God gave me. Uh, to then manifest it into a purpose here on this uh, on this earth. So yeah, I'm right in line with you there. Yeah, amen. Um, what do you? Last question. What do you feel is holding people back from finding success in breaking free from uh, pornography? Comfort. People are too comfortable uh, in their current existence. Um, they're they're unwilling to to step into difficult unknown territories. Um, so it would be, you know, comfort or just uh, kind of a familiarity with the status quo. Mm. Yeah, they don't want to, just like you said, don't want to step out. It's easy to stay stuck. Yeah, um, the, idea, the, 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 the idea of living a porn free life sounds amazing to every guy struggling. Uh, with with the issue, you know, it sounds like, oh, I, I, I you know, I'm not going to, you know, you know, held captive or a slave uh, to this lust that I have, or you know, to these thoughts, or or or, or to this, uh, you know, drug, if we want to, you know, call call internet streaming pornography, which I'd like to do. Um, so, so the idea sounds very compelling to a lot of people. Yeah, it'd be really amazing because um, I could truly live live my, per you know, my God, you know, my God purpose life. But um, most men aren't yeah. willing to do like the difficult stuff you know they're not willing to develop discipline they're not willing to um create willpower and i said develop discipline and create willpower because those are those are things that you actually have to work towards uh achieving they're not just things that you know you were either born with or born without so most people aren't willing to do what is necessary to live a life free of porn and that's just been been my opinion yeah. and you know we've we've worked with over 1100 men you know through our various programs to begin to build a life without pornography. And it's very clear market between the ones that have success and the ones that don't. The ones that have success are, they come in it with, 
you know, the willingness to do whatever it takes. Hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. I know that you have a wealth of knowledge around addiction and recovery. So I want to maximize the time that we have together to focus on understanding the brain and the actions that we can take, anyone listening can take to overcome that. So, but just to lay a foundation so that the listeners know who you are, can you give us the bird's eye view of how you got into, into this field? I always find that understanding someone's background helps us connect with, with the speaker and connect with their message a little bit more. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll do my best here, uh, Tiago, to keep this short and concise. If I get off topic, feel free to, you know, draw me back in at any point. Cause sure. I somewhat do sometimes have the tendency to just ramble on, um, without any rear, you know, clear, like, uh, end to, to what I'm getting at. So yeah, feel free to okay. reel me in at any, at any point. But, uh, yeah, like you said, you know, born, born and raised here in, uh, in Tampa, Florida, and uh, to set some context for my age, because I think that's an important part um, when we're addressing this topic is, is, is I will be 38 later this month. Um, so uh, my introduction to pornography, and I, and, I, and, I, and I preface that context so I could explain how, or explain the beginning of, let's call it this addiction for me. So my introduction wasn't what, you know, most young men are dealing with today, you know, um, obviously, we have a different animal, but I was introduced or, you know, I, I, I came across pornography at a very, very young age, just six or seven years old. And, um, you know, I just I, I, I wasn't developed. I wasn't ready for it. I didn't understand it. Um, but instantly it kind of gave me this feeling of um, curiosity, like it, it, it made me feel good, but I wanted to know why. Um, and, and that kind of, you know, began a journey of, of what at that point would have been almost 30 years. So I'll kind of speed through, you know, teenage years and in my early 20s. Let's just say I was, um, I don't want to say I was a problem child because my home um, and my kind of persona about who I was to the public was very good. Um, but I but I made a lot of uh, poor decisions in my teens and, 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 and early 20s, just around, you know, drug, sex, partying, kind of, you know, the things that we think are going to be fun and enjoyable. I chased it all. I did it all. Mm -hmm. um, and it left me kind of kind of empty. Um, I, I got uh, I got into fitness very, very young as, as well. And I think that's an important part because through my 20s, um, I was succeeding uh, in developing and building, building my body. I, you know, I did a about 10 year stretch as a competitive bodybuilder, um, you know, received a national, you know, ranking here, here in the States, uh, placed fourth in the state of Florida in the classic physique division, um, got into entrepreneurship, you know, started and, and, and grew a business to over $2.1 million in sales. Um, by the time I was 32, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I was achieving a lot, or at least at the time, I thought I was achieving a lot. But my my personal life through my 20s and 30s didn't match uh, what the outside looked like. So, you know, here I was, you know, six foot three, 240 pounds, you know, sub percent, you know, 6% body fat competing, you know, on stages, doing photo shoots, fitness modeling, um, you know, making, uh, you know, not not amazing, like I wasn't, you know, wealthy by any means, but I was making a great living. Um, you know, cars, watches, clothes, shoes, you know, all, all the kind of material things that people chase. But there was this kind of like burning hole in inside of me. Um, mm -hmm. And I never really under, you know, I was never really able to understand why. Um, a lot of that, you know, a lot of those uh, feelings, you know, whether it's, you know, insecurities or, or depression or fear, or anxiety, a lot of started it when I was very young. Um, so it was something that I was familiar with the feeling for and I just at, 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 at times just accepted it as, as who I was. Oh yeah. You know, um, I didn't have a relationship with God back then. Um, not, not that I was angry at him, but I just, I just, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know him. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know, um, who, who Jesus was. So there was no real, you know, spiritual connection or no real, you know, faith in, in my home. But at the same time, I, you know, I was, I was dealing with a lot of these, uh, feelings of, you know, inadequacies, uh, depression and, and, and fear just as a young kid. So I just thought it was a part of like who I was like, God just made me, or I didn't think it was God. I was like, Oh, I just, you know, um, cause I saw other men in my family that struggled with, with a lot of things as well. So to kind of, you know, accelerate this story, um, in my early thirties, as I was, um, looking at, you know, 
expanding my my business reach, I guess, would maybe be the best way to to explain that I was looking at, you know, pivoting from the business I was doing and, and getting into this kind of online marketing space that, you know, probably a large portion portion of your audience is, is familiar with. So this would have been uh, 2016. Um, I, I want to get into the internet marketing space. And in doing that, um, I knew that I didn't have an education. I didn't have a, you know, I don't have an advanced degree in marketing or anything. I didn't really understand internet marketing, um, but I understood like bypassing time. You know, I understood um, getting coaches and, and getting mentors because it had worked for me in bodybuilding. It worked for me in sports and it worked for me in my first business. Um, so in 2000, late 2016, early 2017, I hired my first online uh, fitness business coach, which was Vince Del Monte. Um, and, 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 and that's, that relationship really set me on the trajectory uh, that I've been on for these last four years. So I joined the group with the intention of, you know, learning marketing, building business and networking inside that community. What I didn't realize I was going to uh, be doing by joining that group um, is I was going to be introduced to a, to a different type of man. Um, hmm. You know, I talked about my, my upbringing, not having any real, you know, faith or any, you know, religious um, upbringing. And I also talked about kind of, you know, seeing some of the struggles with other men in my family, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction, suicide, like that was, that was kind of the tree that I came from. When I joined this group, the men that I was introduced to were all men of God. They were, you know, they were strong men that put their faith first. They were all business owners. They all were family men. They all were men that served in their communities. They all men, they were all men that lived, uh, with a purpose for their life. And that purpose was in service of, of other people, all the traits that now in, 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 in these are, you know, the values that I hold very near and dear to me. And I try to build my life and my companies through a lot of these same values that I saw in these, in these men. And I didn't connect it right at the beginning, but I really enjoyed being around them. Like it was, it was mm -hmm. so welcoming. It was so nice to be around a, a, a group of men that didn't judge. They, they loved you for, for who you were. And that love was a very big part of, of that relationship. So this, you know, this mastermind, this business group turned into weekly workouts, which turned into, you know, now many of my best friends are a part of a part of that group. But out of those Thursday afternoon workouts, um, I developed a lot of close friends. And um, for about, you know, 18 months, I was there almost every single week. So this brings us to, um, you know, 2019, February 14th. And it was in that workout environment with that group of individuals um, that I was sitting with one of them after a workout one day. And we're just sitting in my car, just kind of having a conversation like two friends would normally just sit and, and, and kind of catch up. And in that conversation, yeah. uh, one of my best friends, Zach, who's a former Marine, um, and is a big part of our company at Rebuilt Recovery. Um, he shared with me what he had been doing to the way that he phrased it was to uh, harness and manage his sexual energy. It was breathing techniques. He goes, yeah, Frank, I've been doing a lot of these Wim Hof breathing techniques and it's allowing me to harness and manage my sexual energy. And it's keeping me away from porn. And I said, explain more. Um, Cause I never heard a guy talk about his struggles with pornography. Um, and Zach opened up and talked about, you know, his own struggles, which became episode two of the superhuman life about his struggles in the military, about how it was almost encouraged and pushed upon them um, at stressful times that they needed it as as an outlet, wow. um, and that he was never able to you know to move past it. I mean, this is you know six seven years since he had served our country uh, in Iraq, and this was still a part of his life. So he was committed to change, and at that time, um, for the last few months, I had been looking into porn addiction myself. So I guess I kind of skipped over a part of the story um, at the at, towards the end of two thousand and eighteen. On the Vince Del Monte podcast, I heard a conversation with Michael John Cusick. Um, and Michael John Cusick is the author of Surfing for God, uh, which has once again become a you know, foundational part of, of our curriculum. Um, but this was mm -hmm. the first time I'd heard a man speak publicly about his struggles with pornography. And Michael now is fully recovered. He runs an amazing clinic and, 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 and coaches and helps a lot of guys out West. Um, but his story went really deep and dark. And, and in hearing him talk about that, I saw a lot of things that were in my past and I began to see what my future was gonna look like if I didn't get this behavior under control. Um, so after hearing that, I began to kind of look into the brain science of your brain on porn 
um, stumbled across some of Gary Wilson's work, a couple of TED talks and, and, and whatnot, uh, but I hadn't spoken about it yet. So that was, that was late 2018. That takes us to 2019, uh, February 14th, which is the day with Zach. So how all this was kind of being pieced together, I saw a unique opportunity in that car with Zach. And I said, this is your time frame. You either make a decision now um, to change your life or, you know, you're going to be, you're going to be in this hole forever. Um, so I vowed and confessed to Zach right then and there in, in my car, um, outside of, outside of the critical events compound. And I told him that I was ready to remove past it, get it out of my life. Um, but a couple things needed to happen. A, I asked for his help and accountability. I said, I know I'm not gonna be able to do this on my own. I need you to hold me accountable. Um, can you do that? And he fully agreed and said he would be there in my corner, uh, to hold me accountable. And I said, secondly, I need to let Stephanie know. Stephanie was uh, my girlfriend at the time that I was living with. Um, we had been together for, at that point, two and a half years. Um, some things were going very well. And, current, and at that exact moment, um, a lot of things weren't going well. And I took all of what wasn't going well and placed it on my shoulders and said, this is all because of me. Mm. If this is going to change, it's because you're going to change. Um, and, and that was kind of the catalyst. So the next day I admitted to Stephanie, you know, this kind of secret that I'd kept from her for, for years. Um, it comes with a really like epic part of the story where I literally like tore a computer apart and threw it in the trash. Um, and, like literally, like I tore, like I tore yeah. a computer into two pieces. Um, people always kind of like, whoa, that's amazing. Um, but once again, I'm six foot three and, you know, 250 pounds at, at the time and, you know, 560 squat and 600 deadlift whatnot but those aren't important but anyway so i tell you know tear, <laughs> tear, tear the computer apart reach out to zach let him know that i did it reach out to another close friend of mine um to share it with him and the rest has kind of been history you know um there's a lot that's happened in different segments and pieces but yeah that's kind yeah. of the you know the genesis of everything that i'm doing today yeah, and I appreciate that. And for anybody who wants to really kind of dive deeper, um, I believe the very first episode on your podcast, you really go a little bit deeper into your story. And I'm sure you you share it even throughout many other episodes. Um, I appreciate you opening up about that. And I, I feel like many people can resonate with uh, being exposed to porn at, at an early age, especially guys. Um, but I know that it's becoming more and more common with women as well. Um, so let's talk about, oh, before we move on, I just wanted to highlight things. I think it's really cool. Um, one thing that stood out, and we'll get to this later, but like these, what kind of got you into and what gets a lot of people into pornography is that lack, those insecurities that they experience growing mm. up. Um, and it's just a way of escaping. And we're going to talk about that. And I also just wanted to point out, like, thank God for men of faith who who live their faith um, for men who are extremely wealthy, but they also use their wealth for the influence of the kingdom. Um, and it's so nice to be able to have a, a, a group of mentors like that, a tribe um, that supports you, that can coach you, but they're also there as like spiritual mentors. And for those listening, um, you guys probably heard of my interview with Mike Zhang, Mike Zhang, um, and and Frank, they know each other. They know the same people that they're talking about. So it's really cool um, to to interview another great member of, of that community. And so let's let's talk about how PMO, porn, <laughs> masturbation, orgasm, um, addiction starts, so people understand where it comes from, and then why why it's bad. Like you know, some people might think there's nothing to it, but there are negative side effects. And um, before you start, like, would you say that it's fair to, to say that the principles of what we're going to be talking about um, also apply to other forms of addiction, such as food, alcohol, and even procrastination? Oh, 100%. Absolutely. And, and before I answer that, I, do, I want to make one more comment on, on, on the men of faith and just, you know, for the listeners out there that um, that, that are believers and, and are maybe trying to figure out like, okay, how do, how do I kind of become that person that, that Frank had it in life? How do I kind of become, you know, uh, a, a person of influence to maybe bring somebody to their faith? I can tell you one thing that, that none of those guys did. Um, none of them forced their faith. None of them forced their beliefs on me. In fact, I don't think we actually talked about it um, until I was saved. 
It was how they showed up. And I think that's the most important thing. And, and, and one thing mm. that I've really tried to take into my life as a, um, as a Christian, I'm not here preaching, preaching to anybody. I just, I thought it was important to share based on, um, your, your kind of takeaway from, uh, from that story. I, one thing that I've really tried to ingrain in, in the way that I show up is it's not what we say that's going to bring people to the kingdom. It's not a, it's not a Bible verse. It's, 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 it's nothing that's going to come out of our mouth. It's the way that we are going to show up, uh, in the world to where people begin to ask why, why is that guy different? Yeah. What makes Chiago different? What makes Frank different in his environment? Um, and then when they begin to ask why, and they find out, oh, it's because uh, he puts his faith first. Oh, because he's a, a man of God and that's the values. That's the path. So so with none of those men, was it ever forced upon me because I joined the group without, without knowing Jesus, without having a relationship with God and they welcomed me in. And it was never like I was an outcast. Um, they just loved me like I was their, their brother. And, um, and, and that's what I saw. And that's, and that's what I've tried to, to take into to, to my life. So, yeah, I just wanted to add that kind of, kind of note there as well. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. But yeah, so, so to answer your question, do, do the tactics and strategies and things that I teach and talk about, do they apply to other forms, forms of addiction, um, or even procrastination? Or I, I, I would say it applies to anybody that's, that feels like their current situation is, is mediocre. Um, you know, my path to, and I, and I struggle calling myself like a uh, an addiction coach or an addiction counselor. Right. You know, I, 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 I'm not a therapist because I'm not licensed uh, in, in therapy. I am, I am, uh, you know, certified as a addiction coach, but I struggle a lot there. I really try to place myself as like, I help people reshape and reframe their identity. So a lot of the things that we teach and talk about are the same tools and, and strategies and tactics that you apply into your high coaching. It's, it would be the same thing. I interviewed a, uh, licensed psychologist that helps people with food addiction. And we actually kind of like, we were joking after the call, like so much of the similarities and what he does with food addiction and what I'm doing, uh, you know, with pornography or, or, or sex yeah. addiction, you know, I've talked with, um, you know, multiple people that, that work with alcoholics and, and people that work with drug addicts and the principles are, are always the same. It's a path that maybe how you get to those principles or sometimes the articulation of those that varies and differs from person to person. Okay. And where, like, how does, how does this addiction start? Like, why and why is it bad? Yeah, so when I talk about porn and porn addiction, um, and we need to make sure that we preface it with the context that I'm addressing internet streaming pornography. You know, what what you have on, on tube sites, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to name any of the big ones because I'm not going to give them that advertisement, but people know what I talk about when I say internet streaming pornography. It's not the magazines that I was introduced to. It's not even, you know, videos and, and, and DVDs. It's, it's what's available on the internet. This is defined in neuroscience as a super normal stimulus. So I'm sure you could explain mm -hmm. this just, you know, probably better than, than I can, but you know, your brain has this reward center and, and there's, there's chemicals inside of there. So if I get too complicated, once again, reel me back. Um, cause, cause I want to make sure we, we speak to, to the audience here. So we have these neurochemicals in our brain and they're, they're put there, you know, they were designed to keep us moving forward, like keep us moving either towards a goal or keep us, you know, in the place where we are, because we have everything we already need. The one that moves us closer towards the goals is dopamine. Um, now what happens with porn, internet streaming porn, this super normal stimulus is it hijacks your dopamine. So from the first or second exposure, literally the first or second time your eyes place, then you place your eyes on pornography. You've now gotten a super normal stimulus, which is like an accelerated, super enhanced hit of dopamine. It's called super. Yeah, it's something that you, you cannot experience naturally. Exactly. Which is exactly why it's called super, super normal. So yeah, you know, we, yeah. go ahead. I was going to say we weren't designed to even experience that kind of feeling. Yeah, but what ends up happening is the fact that you weren't designed, your brain gets it, and then your brain gets familiar and wants it more. So it's now been given this taste of like, oh, this super advanced hit. So it's no longer going to get pleasure out of the normal hits. It's no longer going to use dopamine yeah. for what it's designed to do, which is the progression of moving closer to towards your goals. 
So this is where it literally hijacks you from first or second exposure and begins to create that addiction cycle because the only place you're going to get dopamine is by seeking out and looking for more pornography. Then you're going to put yourself in this, in this cycle of just always needing more and more. And then it can get even deeper where it needs more extreme, more hardcore. I mean, we can go really far down that rabbit hole if you want to, but yeah, that's kind of, you know, I guess the easiest way to kind of explain like what happens and, and why it's a major problem that literally hijacks your reward center. Yeah. And why does it, so we can go a little bit deeper just because I think understanding for me, it's interesting. And I assume some of my audience finds it interesting too. Uh, the science behind it, like how the brain literally wires itself um, from that first or second exposure. Yeah, so uh, wiring is such a, you know, such a challenge. It's, it, it's, it, it, it's like there's not actual wires in there. So just just think like yeah. if I'm used to, you know, if I'm used to getting, you know, let's call it, let's call it a level five hit, you know, my normal, my normal hit of dopamine is let's call it a five. So what happens is I wake up, I, I take steps towards my goal. You know, I, I take steps every morning to become a more healthy, fit person. So I have my morning routine, go to the gym, whatever the case may be, whatever that step is, as long as I'm moving towards my goal, my brain is going to get me a hit of dopamine. What ends up happening when it gets hijacked is that hit that it got from pornography is like two, three X. So instead of it being a five, it's now a 10 or 15. So if my brain knows that I can get 15 from porn, is it going to want to give me five for going to the gym? No, the brain is going to want to figure out the brain is a survival tool. So it's going to want to survive by getting what it knows it's been exposed to. So why would I give you mm -hmm. a hit of dopamine if you're going to give me five by moving to the gym when I, when I know you can go look at pornography and give me the hit of 10. So you kind of start working literally against your own kind of neurochemistry because it wants one thing. And then I, 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 I guess like, you know, consciously, you know, that that's not what you actually want but your brain is telling you i need this hit i don't want this hit so th did that answer your question yeah yeah i okay. think it helps people kind of uh you painted a good picture with that um let's talk a little bit about like what causes uh people to relapse why is it so hard for people to people that want to stop they try their best if you know, what they, with what they know. Um, but why is it so easy to just to fall back into this, this, this routine, this habit? Like, are they re using the wrong strategy or maybe they're not taking quitting seriously? I, I mean, do you want my honest opinion? Um, yeah, I think for, for most people, the minute it gets a little bit difficult, it's just there, it's, 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 it's too hard for them. And that's why, you know, when you asked me the first question at the beginning, like, why, why do most people struggle or what keeps people from, from real success? It's that, you know, familiarity or, or the unwillingness to really do, do the hard stuff. So I think the fact that we're working against our neurochemistry puts your body in a state of being uncomfortable. Um, you know, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day and it's, um, he's, you know, he's, he's afraid of, of being al like alone in his own, in his own thoughts. Like he's literally is scared to be by himself without some, mm. without doing something. He's just scared of even the thought being too much of a trigger. And like, he'll never find success if he can't get past that. If you can't get past just literally being present by yourself, then you're never really going to find freedom. So yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's strategies and tactics and, 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 and whatnot. But I think what really keeps most people is the minute it gets a little uncomfortable, because we're soft. People are soft. Men are soft. I'm sorry. Like, so the minute it gets challenging or a little bit uncomfortable, I put my pacifier back in my mouth and curl up with a little bit of pornography. Like that's, I mean, that's, that's probably not the best answer that a coach would be saying on a yeah. podcast, <laughs> but I think it's, I mean, I think it's the truth. And it's something I've spent a lot of time really thinking about the last 14 days. Like, Cause I'm running into a, like, I'm running into this issue a lot. I'm, I'm sure you can tell, yeah. like, I'm very passionate about, about this part of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, cause I'm seeing it a lot just with, with guys that I'm working with that guys that want to get help. Um, and I'm figuring out, okay, like, how do I just tell these men, like they need to man up and, 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 and yeah. do the hard stuff. Like, um, so, I mean, that's my honest opinion is just, is, is men are just soft and weak and the minute it gets a little bit uncomfortable, 
they decide that they're not ready. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, it's part of human nature. Whenever, you know, you say that it made me think of uh, Adam, like, where did the original sin get come into into being? And we see Adam, a man who was passive, right in front of his wife, Eve, um, Eve, in when the serpent presented that fruit, right? So it's like the curse on man is passivity. Uh, the reason why so many mm. families fail is because men are passive. They're not being leaders. They're not uh, being responsible. They're not leading the family spiritually. And so that's why um, I believe one factor is why so many men are plagued with the sin of, of, of lusting, of falling to you know pornography. And although it is normal, when it's something like this is normal, that's not the goal, right? We want to be abnormal. We want to be um better than that um so i think just like you said we're soft and people just need to realize that this is a hard fight but it's a fight that is so worth it it's a fight that you need to fight you need to put on the face paint you need to surround yourself with with other men who will fight with you and encourage you um that will kick your butt a coach that will call you out right because um it's so easy to not call yourself out because you already are insecure you already feel bad for yourself so you need somebody to come alongside you and kind of push you up to that next uh next level yeah because being addicted to pornography is it's easy i mean like yeah. and it's common so are you going to do the easy common thing or are you going to do the hard difficult thing that only a small percentage of men are actually achieving and that's breaking through your struggles that's finding finding the freedom i love the analogy that you shared there with with adam though because yeah it was very clear instructions from god like god didn't tell only eve not to eat the apple he instructed both of them you are not to eat from this tree and then eve you know the serpent you know uh convinces eve and then eve takes it to adam it's not that adam like went to the serpent, the serpent with Adam, because the serpent probably knew if I go to him, like maybe he's going to be a little too hard to, to break through. So let me get to Adam yeah. through Eve. But yeah, the instructions were very, very clear from God. Do not eat from this tree. So the same thing here, like we know, like when we just, when we're making the commitment to get this out of our, our life, it's not that we got a call from God, but we've made the hard decision to move past it. And then the minute something gets a little bit difficult in our recovery, I'll just throw the hands up and return back to, you know, what's, what's familiar. That's a great, great analogy you shared there. Mm -hmm. um, maybe let's talk about some preventative measures that people can t do or consider so that they don't fall into this, this habit, or maybe it'll help them, you know, if they're trying to stop, you know, prevent continuing on. Yeah. So, so preventative measures. Um, I think the first one is you have to understand that you're probably not going to do it by yourself. Um, so, so finding somebody, you know, that you can trust in to hold you accountable. Um, and we can talk about accountability because I think a lot of people view that thing the wrong way, but, um, yeah. you know, like somebody that you can share with, and open up with because chances are if you're hearing this and you're thinking like uh you know maybe now is the time or you're questioning like do i have do i have this problem do i need to kind of get it out of my life and work through it et cetera, et cetera. if you're having those thoughts as you're hearing this chances are with almost 98 percent certainty i can say that you've never talked to anybody about this um so i think the first step is is you need to find somebody that you feel safe with and you can open up to just get it out. Like just get it off of your chest. Um, I can tell you what that did for me. It literally felt like 10,000 pounds were taken off my shoulders the minute I was able to talk about it with, with somebody else. So I think that's the first step. It's opening up, sharing with it. Um, and then, I mean, I'm going to drive this, I'm going to drive this home. And I have been all, you know, this entire conversation, truly deciding, like truly deciding the root word for decide is side. It's the Latin, Latin word. It means to kill off. So when you decide, that means mm. you're going to kill off the previous version of yourself. Um, and if that's yeah. the case, then relapsing or not succeeding 
um, is no longer an option. You kill off the previous version of yourself, then yeah, the path may take you longer. The journey may be a little bit longer. There may be more bumps. There may be more things you need to work through. But when you truly decide and you kill off that past version of yourself, then you can begin to build a plan. Um, so that's that would probably be the first two things that most men think they do, but they actually don't do is they don't really find the true accountability and they don't truly make the decision. Maybe there's something lingering in their head. And this is probably a lot of guys. They're like, uh, if I could get past this addiction to where I don't need it every day, maybe I can look right. at it once a month. Maybe I can look at it right. once every three months, or maybe I could go to strip clubs or maybe, you know, maybe I could still, you know, listen to things or, you know, maybe I won't watch the hardcore stuff, but I'll, but I'll watch, you know, the softer stuff. Like if those are any, any thoughts or any way you're trying to convince yourself, like that, this is how you're going to do it. You're, you're, you're going to fail because you're holding on to an old part of yourself. You haven't killed it off yet. So you haven't truly decided. Yeah. And, uh, going off on that, it's like, we, it's, I find we keep our, our sins, our, these, these bad habits as, as pets. It's mm. like, we know they're bad. Um, we want to just keep them around. Maybe, maybe change how we view them. Not this big monster that's going to like destroy us, but we just like, you can't get rid of your little pet um, where you keep the back door open, right? Just in case it wants to come back and we don't decide, we don't kill, we don't fight with that, with that passion because we don't understand the severity of this. And the thing is, like porn rewires your brain. It changes the neurochemistry. When people do brain scans, it changes how your brain functions, where things light up. And so I think the consequences, we, we minimize. We say, oh, you know what? You know, maybe once a week's not too bad, right? We, we treat it as not so bad. Uh, maybe once a month, maybe once a year. But the thing is, the more your brain sees these things, these images, uh, the the more they get ingrained in your brain literally changes its its physical chemistry. And so um, I encourage any any man out there listening to anyone, any woman, anybody who's fighting this fight, struggling, do exactly what Frank said, reach out to a mentor. When you confess these things, you'll realize you're not the only one. And a huge weight will be lifted off your shoulders. And I think that's the first step is understanding that you're not fighting this alone um, and truly make that, that decision, that commitment to give it your all. Don't take this half-heartedly because it's going to um, continue to ruin the way you think. If you feel depressed, anxious, if you feel like everything is going against you, you're not getting good grades or doing well at your job, chances are the shackles of porn are weighing you down um and it's gonna ruin your your relationships your marriage like it just goes on and so maybe we can talk about that um i think we we did touch on it but frank from your experience and what you know what are the the ripple effects that uh consuming pornographic material that supercharges or super i forget the word you said um uh, supercharges the brain what kind of effects does it have in people's lives yeah um well i mean i talked about you know a couple of things that, that that i dealt with growing up that you know um i didn't understand at the time and you know i talked about kind of accepting them as just part of part of my makeup um but you know as i was able to understand more and more what happened i realized that you know my depression anxiety fear uh, lack of attention, you know, ADD, like the inability to focus on a lot of things. Like that was something I struggled with a lot. Social anxiety, mm -hmm. like all of those things that I struggled with through my twenties, like were a product, they were a result of, of my addiction to pornography. So the center of the brain that really gets hijacked is just like prefrontal cortex, like this part that makes us human. This is where, you know, states of flow come in. We're talking about high performance, you know, it's a high performance podcast. Like anybody that's going to be achieving high performance is going to have to tap into these flow states. This is the area of the brain that is getting hijacked from pornography of where these flow states come from. So you literally are preventing you from getting into that top level uh, brain state. I did a podcast with Dr. Trish Lee, who's one of the leading neuroscientists, has been a you know professor for, for two decades 
she talked about the different different brain states. I, I I would have to look at my notes to be able to explain it all. But there's beta, theta, and all these alpha yeah. states. Uh, porn keeps you from really getting into that that flow state. Um, you know, and just just from there, like you know, what what all all comes with that? Like when you when you hijack a part of your brain that is truly what makes you a human, you're now operating from you know more of an animalistic center of of your brain. You know, animals don't have reasoning. They don't have processing ability. You know, they don't have the ability to to make decisions and put things together. So what we know is a lot of guys is just just lack of productivity. So all these brain states I'm talking about, the yeah. end product, the end you know outcome of it, just a lack of productivity. So if you're not finding yourself maybe making progress in life, maybe you think that you know you have great ideas, but you can't take the idea and break it down into actionable steps and then execute upon it. If that's the case, and then maybe it's connected to to a porn thing, but yeah, lack of, lack of productivity. The social anxiety one is that we see a lot of because of what it does, uh, what, what happens to the center of your brain um, that's associated with, with people. So when you look at pornography, the area of your brain that is activated is a part that is associated to, to objects. So it's like, when I look at this cup that's sitting on my desk, the part of my brain that's telling me that's you know connected to my hand, it's a part that's object. When I'm when I'm intimate, when I'm in a relationship with somebody, the part of my brain that is firing is is connected to relationships or connected to community. Well, over time, mm. as you're viewing pornography, because it's activating the object center of your brain, you begin to associate the female form, the female body, no longer as a person meant for relationship and intimacy, but it becomes a object for consumption. So this is where the objectification of women comes into play. You literally see women and all you think about is sexual objectification or consuming them as opposed to relationship, community, fellowship with either your, your, your male friends or, or, or you wouldn't fellowship with females. But so that's that's the really big one is how it begins to reshape how you even look at people and what you do in those social environments because your brain is, is guiding everything that you do. So if your brain is telling you you're going to enter into you know, a group of objects. Well, I don't need to understand how to, you know, have conversations with those people because they're objects and not human, human beings. Right. So real big impact on your, I guess, social skills. So lack of productivity or the inability to complete task, um, you know, social awkwardness or social anxiety. Um, and then the big one, you know, sexually, like a lot of guys struggle with, uh, you know, premature ejaculation, um, the inability to either a get or, uh, maintain uh, erections, and once again, it all just comes down to to the wiring and and what wires together fires together. So if over time you begin to associate looking at a computer screen or looking at your phone with that's the path to get erection, and then you play with yourself and ejaculate, then you've wired the connection for erection orgasm is associated to computer screen or to tablet. So when you're in the actual act of real sex, your brain doesn't even associate that with, oh, you're supposed to have an erection right now because it's, it's it literally has rewired it to the other thing. So those are three big ones right there. Lack of productivity, yeah. social anxiety, and then the physical uh, things that we talked about. Mm, that's powerful. And that's a lot, a lot of side effects. And so um, I, I just feel like taking a pause in this, uh, this episode right now and just saying, if, if you're listening to this, and you struggle with one or all of these, I highly encourage you just pause this episode, go in the description of this video and, and just send myself or Frank a DM. If you really want to open up, if you want to take, uh, make a commitment to the next step, um, because I don't know when you're going to be listening to this, you can just message us, put hashtag um, it's time and say, I came from Born Unstoppable. That way we'll know what episode and what you're referring to. I just want to create this space so that if you're ready to take action and, and kill this, this habit, I give you permission to do so. Um, my Instagram's at Chiago Luzvargi. And Frank, what's your Instagram? Uh, it's the superhuman Frank. Okay, so at the superhuman Frank. All right, so since we just talked about how it impacts people. Um, is it possible to rewire the brain, to undo the mess that has been been created over years? Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's just, you know, 
I guess the field of study um, or, you know, what's known in neuroscience as neuroplasticity. So yeah, just neuroplasticity is the ability for your brain uh, to change over time through, through experience. So yes, there is, there is a path out of this. Um, and it's and exactly kind of, kind of what there's you hope. Said. There's a, there's an unwiring and then there's a rewiring. So I, I break it down and it, and it is actually, in my opinion, it is a two step. So the unwiring begins with, you know, cutting off the consumption, stop doing, stop doing the things that have gotten you to, to this point where you need to make a change. So that's the unwiring process that in my opinion happens like that. Like you just make a decision. Like mm -hmm. I said, kill off the past version of yourself and begin to build a new life moving forward. So the unwiring process begins literally the minute you make that decision, the rewiring and the rebooting process. Yeah. That's a, that's, I mean, that's what our, you know, coaching curriculum and, and programs and products are designed to do, you know, based, um, you know, based on neuroscience, based on um, health, fitness, how the gut, you know, ties in, um, how exercise plays a role um, in all that stuff. But yes, to, to, to answer your question, yeah, there's a, there's a path out of it. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. And so there's hope if somebody's listening and they feel stuck, they feel like it's impossible. There's hope and it's not too late because here's the cool thing. God designed our brains um, to be able to rewire themselves, to be have that neuroplasticity. Now, a question I, I think I wondered this at, at one point, like, is there a certain age where your brain doesn't rewire or is this something that you can always do? Let's say you're, you're 35, you're 40. Like, is it possible to still rewire the brain? Yeah, until, until the day you die. Amazing. Yeah, because I know... Um, I forget what age your brain develops till, uh, till I don't know, twenty five or something, and they say it's yeah, a full, lot easier yeah, for full, kids to rewire. Full full male development is twenty eight. I think female full female development is twenty three, twenty twenty four. Yeah, and up until like the eighties, I believe it was the late eighties, maybe early nineties. It was the belief that once you were fully developed and then it was, then it was fixed. Um, mm. now is it easier for, for younger people to, to rewire? I guess if you're still in that development process, it could in fact be easier. I could tell you that I have found older men have, I don't want to say an easier time, but they're at different stages of their life. So it's, it's, it, it's, it is like an apple oranges comparison. I would guess a guy that's in they're more 40s. fed. They're more fed up with it. Yeah. They're, they're more <laughs> fed up with it. I think that they understand maybe some of the, you know, some of the side effects to a deeper degree. Um, you know, many times they have, you know, layers to families, possible businesses online as well. So there's a lot more writing on the line for them as well. So maybe that has something to do with it. Um, but yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to your age. Um, you 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 will change. you are changing so your brain is wiring um whether or not you you want it to or or not it's just are you guiding that process and do you understand if it's working in your advantage or is it being you know is it guiding or is it being changed in a way that you're going to end up being you know a slave to something else in the future yeah yeah totally um I'd love to hear your your approach to kind of ending porn addi addiction through a holistic approach. I know you you love to view it more as of a holistic. It's not just you can't you know do one thing and then stop. Uh, some of the things that you recommend is changing your diet, exercising. There's a faith component and even fasting. Would you be willing to kind of to to share some of those tips um, that people can start applying, or if they want to learn more, they can reach out to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll share as much as, as much as you want. Um, so I wrote a book called the seven step guide to living life without porn. So maybe we can break down those seven steps. Cause I think that's probably, um, can kind of give people like a, an overall, gen, you know, general view of, of our approach. Um, so I think the first step or two, uh, we kind of already talked about it. And it's like that, that realization and acknowledgement that there is a problem um and that you're committed committed to changing it so like that's i mean mm -hmm. if you're going to do anything in your life you have to you have to admit something needs to happen and something needs to change and then commit to it so those are the those are the first steps you talked about the fasting yeah we we use fasting um through a few different uh a few different ways 
early on in the program, um, we do an extended, I, I say extended, it's, it's two days. Um, I like the guys to fast for 48 hours before I have them map out a vision for their life. And I do that for three reasons. Um, one of them being, you know, the spiritual side of things. You talked about that. So we have a, you know, full uh, scripture and prayer component to it. But spiritually, you know, we're called, you know, whether you're, you know, believer, Christian, or, you know, subscribe to any other religion, every, you know, every world religion is going to tell you to fast. Um, you know, the Bible does tell us that we, we should fast and seek the presence of God um, over and over, especially in the New Testament. So we do it at that point in the program because that's a pivotal part of the time. That's a pivotal part of the program where we're setting kind of our intention. So I think we want to be in union with God when we're setting the intention for the plan, for the program, and for our life. So that's why we fast there. I also think fasting is an incredible tool to help us develop discipline and willpower. And I talked about this on the podcast with Dave Asprey, um, who wrote the book called Fast This Way. Um, and he broke it down this way. He said that willpower is nothing more than having the necessary energy to make the proper choice when faced with a difficult mm -hmm. decision. And how fasting is going to help you get there is most men struggle with pornography, or at least this is what I've seen, later in the evening. So later in the evening, when we have what's called decision fatigue. So that's one thing, okay. decision fatigue. We can only make so many decisions throughout the day. Um, if we use fasting, or let's call it at this, at this point, intermittent fasting um, into, our, into our lifestyle, then we've eliminated one, if not two or three decisions that have to be made throughout the day, which is what are we going to eat? So we're keeping ourselves from getting into decision fatigue. And also every time you eat, your body has to utilize energy, electrons to process that food. So if looking at willpower is having the necessary energy to make the proper choices when faced with a difficult decision. If we could preserve our energy throughout the day by not eating, not using that energy to process the food, then we have those energy stored later on in the evening when we're going to be more susceptible to, mm. um, to triggers, more susceptible to the urges. So the second part that we fast right at that point in the program is I believe that it enhances and helps us build more discipline and willpower. And then the third reason that we fast at that point in the program is I want the men in a state of ketosis. The state of ketosis is nothing more than your body is utilizing the stored fat for energy as opposed to sugar or stored carbohydrates. What most people will tell you, and, and this is because your brain's preferred energy source is ketones, not carbs. So what we notice is most, most people get an enhanced sense of clarity, an enhanced sense of focus when they're in a state of ketosis. So when I have you sit down and write out a vision for your life, or set the intention for the program, I want you clear headed and I want you focused. Um, so that's a third reason why we utilize the fasting right then and there. So we use it early on for those three reasons that I shared you. And then the fasting is something we do on a weekly basis um, for all those reasons as well to once again, keep us closer to God and growing spiritually, force us to you know do difficult stuff um, and, and grow in our discipline and then the ketosis part as well. So yeah, admit and commit fast then you write then you write a like a plan for your life I've, I've mentioned this numerous times if we're going to build or create a life without pornography the key word there is build or create you're not going to build or create anything without having a plan of how you're going to do it yeah. and what you're going to do so if we know that porn has really impacted us in certain key areas the fastest way to get out of that is to make a plan to improve those areas of our life. So we actually have these men sit down and map out a plan five years into the future, bring that down to one year and then actually bring it down so much to the point that the minute they're done with this exercise, they know what they need to do tomorrow. I tell people all the time, you want to guarantee you don't look at pornography tomorrow, design your day to where you're not going to look at pornography. So it all comes down to plan. Yeah. Like if you have a plan for your life tomorrow that doesn't include porn and porn made its way into your day, then who do we have to blame for it? You. Mm -hmm. And this is where we, we begin to kind of help people understand that they're in control of all of this. They're in control of all the decisions that they make. And it's just having kind of some conscious awareness of the things that I'm putting in, into my life. Um, so yeah, so admit and commit, fast, design a life, uh, design a payment plan for your life, break that plan down into actual steps. They need accountability. Um, and then just begin to, to, to build beliefs. So yeah, that's kind of the, 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 the overall kind of generalized view of, of what we do. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, I know that 
Uh, I love you're going to be the first person to talk to this about, I think, on this podcast. Well, maybe uh, I've talked to like Dr. Martin, but um, I know the diet that you ascribe to something that you did in your journey was the carnivore diet. I, I love to hear your opinion um, on maybe a little bit of your experience, but also the experience of many people within the program and how it's mm. helped uh, dozens. It's not like a sample of one. It's a sample of uh, however many you've, you've coached. Yeah, and uh, this is something I'm really excited about because some of the things I'm working on now are kind of taking me back into that diet because um, we have uh, a, a new launch coming at the end of this month anyways. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny because when I look back now, in a way, I kind of feel that the – and I didn't share this in the story because I wasn't – I didn't know that this question was coming. Um, <laughs> the carnivore diet for me started a month in a week before, um, I made the decision to quit porn. So many ways, I almost feel like we wouldn't be here doing any of this if I hadn't made the decision, um, back in early January, 2019, that I was going to go on the carnivore diet. Um, I needed a, I needed to do something with my health and nutrition at the time, although I had been a bodybuilder, um, 2018, the end of the year was really tough for me personally. Um, and I got into some really bad habits. I was drinking quite a bit. I was eating, uh, very, very bad. Um, I probably put somewhere, you know, 30 pounds of unwanted weight on and I needed to lose mm -hmm. it. Um, and I wanted to lose it really fast. So I got into the carnivore diet cause I just wanted to, I just wanted to see what I could do in 30 days, um, with my body. And uh, the product of that was 21 pounds dropped, 11% uh, body fat, um, and, you know, everything else that we talk about now. But, um, yeah, it kind of worked opposite for me because I did the carnivore first, and then I found, like, it, it, it just quitting porn for me became so easy because I'd gone through this carnivore transformation. I can't put my finger on it, and I don't have anything, like, supporting it. But I think when we learn to live off of, like, the bare minimum, when you learn that you don't need the cookie or you don't need even the potato, you don't even need like the piece of fruit to make you feel not even good, but amazing. When you literally learn that like just a little mm -hmm. bit of beef and some organ meats can make you feel absolutely amazing. Then you begin to realize that the things that you felt that you needed in your life really needed um, were, were, were false, you know, whether that's alcohol or drugs or porn or even, you know, certain items of clothing or even certain relationships. Like you just begin to kind of live this almost minimalistic uh, approach and you begin to really thrive in those type of environments. Um, now, what we notice with a lot of the students and clients, because you can, you can probably, you know, speak to this a lot better than, than I can, but our gut microbiome being kind of the second brain, a lot of our thoughts, mm -hmm. feelings, and emotions, I believe are tied to our gut microbiome. And one thing that the carnivore diet really does is it completely resets that. Like if you've been eating garbage, you know, or junk food, or even like you've been eating somewhat decent, but you know, two, three times a week, like you have a little bit of Ben and Jerry's and then, you know, you maybe overdo it on, on the weekends with some carbs over time, that buildup that begins to kind of change everything in our gut microbiome and literally just going on a reset, you begin to kind of get this like new sense of clarity, like newfound energy, all these things that just drive us for, for life. Um, so that's a big reason, big reason is why, but a lot of the reasons why we do it is, is, is just controlling, controlling, um, our urges, controlling, um, our temptations, whether that's for food, uh, porn, sex, or lust, like just, just learning to kind of manage a lot of that is one of the things that we really get out of, uh, the carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just want to share, like, I have worked with, with you, Frank, uh, for the viewers to know that from a high performance per, uh, point of view, uh, I've done some of these things, um, pretty much all of it. And I benefit, I lost, uh, within two months, I lost like 10 pounds. My performance went through the roof. I even started my own coaching business <laughs> as some of uh, people listening know, and that's been going well. And never would I have thought that would, I would have been able to do that. And, um, I'm a super huge fan of the carnivore diet. Um, I, and I do land somewhere in the middle just because I like the the term nutrivore. We always want to eat the foods highest in nutrients. Um, mm. You know, so carnivore is really good for 
uh, maybe a short period of time to give you yourself a reset, but then you always want like high density foods. And that's really, I think where every health expert would land on. And uh, just to share something that I've learned and people who've listened to this podcast probably have heard Dr. Martin in my uh, second or third episode talk about this, you know, having a good, uh, just a meat-based diet for a month really, or just less, but resets the gut lining, just like you said, huge gut brain connection, gut skin connection, gut everything connection. I, I think something like 90% of our serotonin receptors are in the gut. And the rest are in the brain, which mm. is ridiculous because that's how you get that butterfly feeling and the adrenaline. We have so many receptors. And if we're messing it up with carbs, with sugar, your system, your hormones are going to be thrown off. And so if you want to tackle this with the clarity of mind in a state of ketosis, like you mentioned for fasting, um, and then doing this diet for a month, I would say is a good start. And something else that I learned is that just after one week of a, a carnivore diet, you empty the liver out. And by doing that, you decrease your inflammation. And there's so many, it only takes one week mm. to empty the liver. And so then your liver starts functioning a little bit better, decreases the toxins because it's working. And so these are things that I've just learned through reading, through listening to other doctors talk about this diet. And so um, if somebody here doesn't really like meat, I would say maybe try a keto version then go carnivore, but don't knock it till you try it because um, it truly, truly is powerful. Um, and I think it's totally worth it. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, no, I love, I love uh, what you said there with, with, with Nutrivore, you know, like the, the nutrient dense foods, the whole foods, the natural foods that, you know, like God put here on earth for, for us to eat. So if we talked about the super normal stimulus of internet streaming pornography, like our brain is not developed for it. Do we think that our brain and body is developed for the supernatural or the supernormal stimulus that you're getting from the cookies or that you're getting from whatever engineered, highly processed, manufactured food um, that, you know, engineers and scientists are working day and night to try to figure out how to hijack your brain with the food. So yeah. the same things that I'm talking about as far as like understanding how your brain gets hijacked from pornography, food is doing the the same thing so yeah maybe an all meat isn't isn't exactly the dream that you you thought of um i would say probably you know give it 30 days like you said that, that's amazing i didn't know that fact with seven days in the liver um and then the 30 day kind of gut lining i did know the gut lining in 30 days but the seven day with the liver makes a lot of sense because i'm here on so i'll tell you i haven't been full carnivore uh for a while i went through like a like a muscle building bulk phase over the summer and then it kind of got out of control but i'm on day nine now of uh doing a 75 hard challenge which i'm doing carnival mm. in addition with the 75 Jeez. hard um i feel amazing like literally day nine like i'm like i feel like a new person already um and a lot of it Great, is now, now beginning to make sense uh, and just to cover my butt this is not medical advice please consult your doctor <laughs> before applying it so i'm not telling you to go if you experience side effects it's not my fault <laughs> okay um oh i did have a, a quite a question or I wanted to go off of that. Uh, but yeah, the, the carnivore diet is, is uh, super good. Oh, I just wanted to say, yeah, when you eat sugar, I forget the comparison, but Dr. Martin makes this comparison, in his podcast, but when you eat sugar, it takes less than a second for it to make its way to the brain. As soon as it's digested, like it's just cocaine, it's cocaine for the brain. Um, mm -hmm. And when you eat like natural whole foods, it's it, it's different. So it literally does hijack your brain. Um, and that's, you know, why some people, um, a lot of people in North America and the world struggle with uh, food addictions as well. Yeah. And I can tell you um, the first piece of fruit. So I, I, I went, I think the first time I did it, six or seven months of the first the first 60 days was all beef. I did all beef for 60 days. And then I got into, you know, kind of a full carnivore, which I was having cheese and pork and bacon. But I did that for like six months. The first piece of fruit that I had after that was like a, like a explosion in my mouth, of just <laughs> like the sweetness. Like it literally, like it reset the palate to taste the yeah. like nature's candy. Fruit is nature's candy. And when you reset these uh, taste buds in your mouth, when you reset the lining in your stomach, you actually like get get those real pleasurable 
things. It's it's like ten it's times amazing. better than real sugar. Oh, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Oh man, I can attest to that with honey. When I did carnivore um, a couple months ago, and I tasted honey, mm. I would just. It'd be heaven. I would just soak in every lick and, and, and Jess, she'd be on the phone and I'd be like, babe, honey is amazing. <laughs> I'm so thankful God created this. And she's like, you're so like in love with that. And I'm like, it's, a, it's the eating meat all day. I need something sweet and it's just so good. I think it just... Yeah, um, and- and technically, it takes you know, a- I don't care, you know, so, some, some carnival zealots will tell you that this is not the case, but you know, I've had a couple of people on the show. We talked about this. Yeah. Technically we put honey into the category cause it comes from bees. So it's kind of, although bees yeah, are not yeah. really an animal, they're more of an insect. Um, I, know a lot of people that, I know a lot of people that include honey in their, in their carnivore diet. So yeah, that, that is so true. Yeah. Anyways, if you, if you're not liking the taste of food right now, go carnivore or just eat the same thing every day for a while and then you'll reset your palate. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay. So uh, moving on, um, what are some practical things that people can do to avoid triggers or at least lower the amount of triggers that they experience in their environment? Because that's a, a huge uh, part of it. That's part of the equation of why people relapse. Yeah. Um, if you're, you know, if you're committed to this process, um, one of the first things you need to do is like, you need to do like a, like an audit on yourself, like, like an actual inventory of maybe go, you know, two weeks. Like when, when was I looking at porn over the last two weeks? Like get clear on all the times that it happened. So it's almost like you need to get in front of them before you prevent them. So understanding like, where am I susceptible? Where am I weak? Where am I actually falling into these things? So if they identify by doing like an audit on your life, okay, the last 14 days or 30 days, this is the times I looked at porn. What were the events leading up to it? So audit your life to begin with so you can understand what are actually my triggers. You're not gonna prevent something if you actually don't even know what it is because what triggered me would be completely different than what triggered you or what triggered so-and-so or so-and-so and so-and-so. So understanding where the triggers are it's the first step. Then once you've understand what they are, build a plan for what you're going to do the next time. It's almost like you don't want to avoid them. I actually tell people like you should actually be looking for the trigger. Once you've done this mm. initial work, once you've done the audit and you put a plan on what you're going to do the next time that trigger occurs, you should almost be anticipating it because it's in that process. This is where you actually take over the rewiring process and put it in your own hands. Because what's happening right now is the trigger, the trigger is not what's leading you to look at porn. It is the actual mm-hmm. trigger that is firing your brain to then tell you to go look at porn. So the trigger is nothing more than like the, the trigger. I mean, I, it's called a trigger because it's the yeah. trigger that set off a series of events. Now, if you understand what that trigger is and then make a plan for what the next event, you're going to change the series of events that happen. This is where you actually rewire yourself. So you understand what the trigger is. and Right now, the default has been trigger. Brain tells you next action. Next action is to go look at pornography because you've laid the groundwork and you've mapped it out. Trigger occurs. You now are able to cut it off at the point of where your brain is going to lead you to that next path. And then you actually do what you said you were going to do. Now your brain is going to go, oh, triggered. Action is not go look at porn. Action is what Frank Mm -hmm. said he was going to do. Now, it doesn't happen fully rewire you in the first time. It may take two, three, four times. And then over time, those triggers will get weaker and weaker and weaker. But yeah, like avoiding triggers outside of like just understanding like you can't maybe watch the same things, keep your eyes off the girl's butt at the gym, like understanding just kind of like self-control. I think the best tip for people with triggers is to understand what they are, build a plan for them. And then when they actually arise, do what you said you were going to do. Okay. Yeah. That's really good. If you uh, avoid avoid the fire, and you won't create an explosion. Yeah, <laughs> the guy. yeah. And then I mean, and then you know, like common sense stuff. You know, like if you were struggling with alcohol, like I wouldn't say spend every Friday night hanging out at the bar. You know, if you had an issue with shopping, I wouldn't say you know go to the mall every Saturday and and be there for eight hours. If you were a gambling addict, I'd say stay out of the casino. Um, so if you're struggling with porn, sex, lust, and a lot of these things, keep your eyes set on the things that they're supposed to be on. Don't go to the strip club, you know, avoid the gym at the busiest time where the girl is going to be there with so-and-so. Have some common sense and 
don't do things that you know are going to lead you to make you know to make stupid decisions yeah um Frank, I know you're you're really big on on productivity. Um, I'm starting to, or I started not too long ago, coaching people in high performance. Do you have any tools or resources uh, that that you would recommend uh, to increase people's productivity? Because here, I'll try to make a connection because I kind of transitioned um, right out of that. But I find, uh, just like you mentioned, if you keep your calendar busy, if you are being productive, you're creating, you're cultivating. And you don't leave room for porn to even be in your your schedule. You're going to increase your your success rate. And so, um, with that being said, what are some some tools or resources that you recommend for people listening to be more productive in in their business or in in school? Besides hiring you or buying your course, uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, in, increasing productivity. Yeah, like are there apps that you use, programs or methods um, that you just naturally do that you might want to just share and be like, hey, it works for me, it might work for you? I'm a simple guy, man. I, I'm, I'm not big into tech and apps. Um, I mean, I have some, but for, I, you know what? I, it's probably not what you're probably looking for. Probably just routines. But, probably not what you're looking for, but I think, if you want, if you want, if you want high performance productivity apps, I think it, I think most people could benefit from getting really clear on the vision for their life. Like I don't think most people mm. actually know what they're working towards and why what they're trying to do fits into a bigger picture. If you're struggling to like complete things, then you're just like you, you you're not driven, you're not motivated to do it, and motivation is not going to come from outside. Motivation is motives. It's the reasons for doing things. Um, so if you want to increase your productivity, like understand how what you're trying to do is it fits into the bigger picture for your life. And if it doesn't, yeah. then don't do it. Like, I mean, um, you know, from a business, you know, from a business owner perspective, like if that's the case, there's a lot of things that that are on my plate that maybe aren't like I, I understand they're, they're going to move me towards, you know, the bigger vision. For my life but it's not things that i need to be doing then i'm going to subcontract them out to somebody else i'm going to find somebody else to do them but i think yeah. most people outside of all the other you know hacks and stuff but i tried i wanted to get something that maybe like is different and and, and i yeah. think that this is it i think you got to get really clear on a the vision but how whatever it is that's sitting right in front of you fits into that bigger vision Maybe, and, and this is, takes, you know, maybe this takes some time of actually sitting down because maybe it doesn't fully align, but in order to get to the next step, you need to complete this. You know, I know you probably have a lot of younger people, uh, listen to probably a lot of students and maybe they have a hard time, like, uh, this Tuesday morning class, like it doesn't do this and that, that, that. but understand from the bigger grain of scene, cause you, you got to like really span out like 30,000 foot view on your life and you can see the pieces, how they fit together, then that should work as, as the motivation, but yeah, I mean, habit building, you know, keeping the promises, not snoozing, you know, um, you talked about fun, you know, one of the things that that I build into, you know, your five S are very similar, minor faith, fitness, finance, family and freedom. And when I talk about freedom, that's kind of my fun. That's what are you doing outside of productivity? So life shouldn't always be productivity, productivity, productivity. And if that's what you're trying to fit and that's what you're trying to force to happen, you're going to run into burnout coming from somebody yeah. that has experienced burnout. If you don't have, I don't want to say balance because I don't think life is meant to be balanced, but if you don't have a component yeah. of your life that is meant for you to unwind, to disconnect, to get out of the grind, the hustle and bustle, everybody want to go 24, grind while they're sleeping, this and that, da, da, da. It's, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. There's got to be some element of like getting out of the work mode and getting into a fun or freedom mode and, and doing other things. Um, so yeah, I know that's something rambling a lot here, but um, vision for your life so you can get really clear on what's sitting in front of you, why you're not motivated to do it, how it fits into the bigger picture, habits, structure, all these things that you you know teach and talk about by you know by Chiago's course, um, but then also balancing it with some fun or some freedom. I love it. You're such a coach. You even summarize everything at the end. <laughs> you saved me from having to do it. You, you know, it's funny you say that because I was having a, I was having, I don't have a lot of friends. 
uh, outside of like my buddies, you know, but, but I was talking with, I mean, she's, she's a girl, she's a female. And we were just, you know, we were having fun and, you know, we're kind of like similar stage in her life. She's seeing what I'm seeing. We're just talking about these things. And we literally talked for like 90 minutes. And first of all, I was like, Oh my God, Tasha, like I haven't spoken to somebody on the phone in a really long time, but then we wrapped it up and I said, okay, I was like, just so we can review and recap. And I literally did exactly that. And she's like, do you do this with everybody? And I was <laughs> like, well, kind of like I'm a coach <laughs> and I want to make sure you go do the things that you said you're going to do. But yeah, it's, it's just the, the, the recap process is just, a, it's a part of my makeup, I guess. That's hilarious. That's great. Um, all right. So what's, what's one of your favorite quotes? I know, I think that we can learn a lot from quotes. And so which one that stands out for you? Uh, there's so many of them, um, but I'll give you the one that is on my email signature. Um, and it's, it's a part of, I believe it's on the Frank Rich Fitness website as well. And it's uh, by Socrates. Uh, no citizen has the right to be an amateur in the matter of physical training. What a disgrace it is for a man to grow old without ever seeing the beauty and strength at which his body is capable. Um, mm. So, you know, deep, I'm a, I'm a fan of Socrates. I'm a fan of the Stoics. Um, but that is, you know, that's, that's, that's why our podcast, that's why our coaching company is, is designed to help you through faith and fitness. Because I think that physical part, that building of the strength, seeing what your body is capable of, really pushing your physical body to its ultimate limits is a part of what we're all supposed to do here. We're supposed to see what we're Perfect. physically capable of. Yeah, so we can be uh, unstoppable and become mm -hmm. superhumans. Um, what are three traits of someone who is unstoppable? Integrity. Courage. And discipline. Integrity, courage, and discipline. It's good. I like it. Do you want to explain? We can leave it at that. Well, yes, for yes, for three. Um, and those are three of the five that's that i try to live my life through i guess you call maybe you know my values uh for my life and those are courage discipline no honor integrity courage discipline and wisdom so i had to cut two of them out because you only asked for three um so those were the three oh, that yeah, there you go. probably answered your question uh the best but i can the explain other two are bonus I five i can explain how i got to five because i just did it on the podcast last week um honor you know i talked a few times I, I, I live here in the states i love my country i honor those that have come before me um, and I try to honor, you know, my roles and responsibilities in, in this world. And I take all that stuff very seriously. Integrity. I want to be a man of my word. I want people to know that when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to follow up and do it. And I also want to be, you know, I want to keep integrity with myself. So when I say I'm going to do things, I keep those promises that I made to myself. Honor, integrity, courage, um, the willingness to step into fear, the willing to, to, to seek out challenges and do the hard stuff. Because I know that's where freedom, success is found. Discipline. Mm -hmm. Um, once again, it's, 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 it's in my willing, uh, to sacrifice the things that I want most right now for the life that I want to live, uh, long-term, you know, so that's, that's, that's obviously a big one. More importantly, especially with the work that I do, discipline is foundational piece for, for me and bodybuilding, health, fitness, and then obviously the recovery work. Um, and then wisdom, you know, I, I mentioned the Bible as the ultimate source, source of uh, truth and wisdom. Um, so everything that I try to do, you know, I try to have rooted, um, in, in the word of God, you know, I try to you know, try to live my life, you know, through a biblical context. Yeah, man. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I know we're getting to, to the end of the interview. I just want maybe in, in a sentence or two, um, if you could go back in time and you could give advice to your 20 year old self, what would you tell him? Yeah, you know, I've been asked this question a few a few different times. Um, so I was trying to see if there was a different answer than I've given before up there somewhere, but there's yeah. not. Um, for me, it would be it's going to be it's all going to be okay. Um, mm. You know, I like I said, we didn't get a lot into it, uh, but there were multiple, at least a handful of times, you know, through my twenties, um, where I contemplated ending it all. Um, very scary scary to admit here, um, scary to experience. Uh, and I never mm -hmm. wish that upon anybody. Losing somebody in your life from suicide is, is hard to deal with. I've had to go through that with multiple people in my family and friends. Um, and I think a lot of times when, when I was at those points, 
the only thing that kept me was the people in my life. Um, so for me, I probably would have saved myself a lot of pain, would have saved myself a lot of uh, darkness and depression if I would have known that it was all going to be okay. Um, so if I really could go back and say anything to my 20 year old self, it's all going to be okay. God's got your back and he's got a plan for your life. Great. Well, bro, I am so thankful that you're here. You're here um, sharing your, your wisdom. You're changing and impacting lives. God is using you in a very mighty way. And I'm so grateful for, for your presence here. Um, if people resonate with your message, resonate with the information that you're, you're sharing, I want to give you the floor. So how can people get in touch with you? And also go ahead and maybe give a quick summary uh, so people understand what your podcast. We never got around to talking about it, but it's a really good podcast. You have amazing guests. Um, and there's more of what we talked about today in many, many episodes. So how can people get in touch with you? Yeah. And, and, and thank you. And, you know, I'm incredibly grateful, you know, to have gotten a chance to, to meet and know you and, you know, develop a very close, uh, you know, friendship with you over, over these past six months or so. So um, I want to acknowledge you as well for having the conversation today um, because, you know, even just opening up your platform for me to share my story and the work that I do um, is a major step, you know, obviously for, for the mission and for, for the movement. So the fact that you were willing to, A, you know, put your time, but also put this, you know, in front of, in front of your audience, it really does mean, mean the world to me. And, uh, and, and I appreciate you before that. So thank you. Um, yeah. You know, how to connect with me, you know, we, you, you, you dropped the Instagram there. Um, that's probably the best place socially to hang out. Um, if, if, if what we talked about resonated and, you know, you maybe kind of want to start looking at like, how do I take some steps? Um, check out the seven step guide, you know, that's at the seven step guide.com. It's absolutely free ebook. You know, you just put your email address. We send it to you right away. Um, you know, maybe check out our YouTube channel as well. So we release daily content videos over there. That's at rebuild your life. Um, and then, yeah, you know, for everybody that enjoys listening to these long, you know, these long form, uh, you know, podcast style interviews, um, we've been at it for just over two years. We're 87, 88 episodes in, depending upon when this airs, it might be closer to 90. Um, and it's, you know, it's these long form kind of discussions. You know, we've, we've had guests on um, from the likes of, you know, Dave Asprey um, in the health and biohacking world. You know, we had Ryan Mickler from Order of Man, Dr. Caroline Leaf on, um, you know, talking about the brain and neuroscience. Uh, we've had NFL Super Bowl champions. We've had, you know, war veterans, Navy SEALs, Army Rangers. Uh, we have CEOs, we talk high performance. Um, it's really a, a, a podcast that is, it is designed for men looking for, you know, breakthroughs in their lives, uh, in faith, fitness, finance, family, and freedom. So very similar, uh, to what the born unstoppable is all about. So if you enjoy what Chiago is doing here, you would love what we're doing. Um, so yeah, check that out. That's at the superhuman life podcast. Superhuman is two words. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on this podcast and we'll stay in touch and take care, bro. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode. Listen, God created you to be creative and he gave you a unique potential, but oftentimes we don't know how to tap into that. Some of us need more guidance than others. I know that because that was me. If you want to develop high performance strategies and become unstoppable, then I'd love to hop on a call with you today and see how we could work together. So go ahead and book a free strategy call with me at www.chiagolusvargi.com forward slash strategy. I'll see you soon.